good afternoon and thank you all for coming to Humanities Decanted, which is the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center's informal showcase in which faculty members present their and discuss their newest research and creative work. Um, I'm Susan Derwin. I direct the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center and it's really my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, to begin, I want to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center is located, and I would like to pay respect to elders, both past and present. I am so happy to welcome Liz Carlisle uh, here to the IHC. She is an associate professor in, Envi in the Environmental Studies program where she teaches courses on food and farming. She has written three books about regenerative farming um, and agroecology, agro Lentil Underground, which um, the co-authored Grain by Grain, and more, most recently, the book she'll be discussing today, Healing Grounds, Climate Justice, and the Deep Roots of Regenerative Farming. And Liz will be speaking today with Peter Alagona, a professor also in the Environmental Studies Program and the director of the Interdepartmental PhD Emphasis in Environment and Society. Peter's writings include the monographs After the Grizzly, Endangered Species in the Politics of Place in California, and The Accidental Ecosystem, People and Wildlife in American Cities. So Liz is going to begin with a short presentation, and then she and Peter will speak with each other for about 30 minutes about Liz's book. And following the conversation, we're going to open up the discussion to you, our audience members. We will bring you microphones. So, so just raise your hand, and this will appear under your mouth. And um, you can ask questions. You can share your thoughts. Um, and most importantly, please feel free to continue to enjoy our refreshments, which are in the back during the event. Unlike our other events, for those of you who've been here, we have, in the other events, we have a reception after the event in that room. But this is sort of like a graze and enjoy and chat event. All right? So uh, Food and drink are there, and uh, now it's my pleasure to welcome Liz. Thank you so much, Susan, for the invitation, and thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I know there's lots and lots of things always going on on campus and in Santa Barbara, so really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation about this book, and thank you so much, Pete. Um, I'm really excited for your questions and getting into this discussion. I'm just going to kick things off um, with a few minutes of um, telling you a little bit why I wrote this book, where this is coming from for me, a little bit of the origin story of this project, and then we'll, we'll get into the conversation. So I'm really concerned about the future of rural communities in the United States, particularly in the face of climate change. And it's really personal for me. I was born and raised in Montana. Uh, my grandmother actually lost our family farm in the Dust Bowl. And I've been on a long and winding journey throughout my life trying to figure out what I can do about this concern about rural communities in the United States in the face of climate change. So I went to college. I got a degree in folklore and mythology, really interested in rural stories and rural music. I had a brief career as a country singer. Then I went to Capitol Hill and worked on policy around agriculture and rural environmental and economic issues. And then I landed at UC Berkeley in the geography program doing community-based participatory research with the organic farming movement in Montana. And in that work, something really landed with me about this idea that although Farming in the U.S. is currently a really big part of the climate change problem and other environmental problems, that there are ways of farming and growing food that could actually be part of climate solutions. And so that's really been the direction of my work and my research and my writing for the past 15 years. And I've gotten to learn lots of really cool things about soil health and nitrogen fixing pulse crops and how farmers can work together uh, to build farming systems that are more um, healthy for the environment and for their communities. 
And about, I would say, you know, five, ten years ago, this idea started exploding in the media and in popular culture, in documentaries, even in Hollywood, in the policy world, around regenerative agriculture. Kind of a new buzzword that hadn't really been circulating when I was in graduate school and doing dissertation research. But because I'd written about soil health, people started asking me, what do you think about regenerative agriculture? And so I had to figure out actually what that meant. <laughs> and kind of in a nutshell, what people were talking about when they used that phrase was the idea that if you use certain agricultural techniques, you can use plants to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and pull it down into the soil and sequester it. And that that could actually help us with climate change, with the balance of carbon, with biogeochemical cycles. And so as people were asking me whether this worked, I realized I didn't actually really know a whole lot. And so I started talking to friends who were soil ecologists who were working on this question to, to really try to get a sense of like, where is the science at on this? If people do the kinds of stuff that my organic farming friends are doing, planting soil building cover crops, rotating their crops, planting more perennials, can they in fact sequester meaningful amounts of carbon in the soil that would really help with climate change? I thought this was actually a really exciting idea for you know, rural revitalization, rural economic development. But when I talked to the scientists, it really seemed like Oh, this was an emerging field and the jury was still out. You would see some journal articles that would say, oh yeah, we can sequester meaningful amounts of carbon and make a serious dent in climate change with this regenerative agriculture. But then you would see other journal articles that were like, ah, not quite yet. You know, we think this is maybe more hype than substance. So I actually started this book project trying to really understand if regenerative agriculture really could be a significant climate solution. And I started by asking people who were doing things that really there was good sound ecological evidence would make a serious difference for environmental issues and climate in particular. So I went out and I spoke in depth with, with four people in particular. So I'll tell you just a little bit about each one of them. Um, I spoke with Latrice Tatsy who's a soil ecologist who works on buffalo restoration. She's a citizen of Blackfeet Nation in Northwest Montana. And she's really interested in researching as buffalo are restored to their homelands at Blackfeet Nation, what is the impact on vegetation communities and soil? Um, she's also a cattle rancher. Her family have been ranching cattle, and she's interested in how bringing back these relatives, Eni in Blackfeet, bison, um, might actually help uh, ranchers on the reservation to think about how they graze their cows in ways that learn from these historical patterns of, of bison grazing. And then I also talked to a woman named Olivia Watkins who uh, practices forest farming. She's actually growing mushrooms in the understory of forested land that's been in her family for over 100 years in the Raleigh-Durham-Chapel Hill Triangle area of North Carolina where her uh, great uncle, um, great great uncle actually, was one of the first black landowners in the area. So she's really passionate about conserving Black-owned land as well as conserving forest in this rapidly urbanizing area. I also spoke to Ive Guzman, who's a researcher, a soil ecologist, who works with immigrant farmers in the Central Valley in California who are practicing polyculture. Um, and so multiple plants um, that are synergistic rather than just monocultures and how that affects soil ecology. And then I talked to another woman in the Central Valley, Nikiko Masamoto, who's the third generation on her family's farm where they grow peaches and nectarines and raisin grapes. Um, and she's inherited it from, from her parents who converted the farm to organic. And before that, from her grandparents who actually started the farm after they had been interned during Japanese American internment. And so for Nikiko's whole family, there's this really deep story about finding a place of belonging in American soil and what it meant for them to really invest in soil health and add organic matter when they really had no reason to believe that that land and that experience wouldn't be stolen from them again. So in the wake of all these conversations, on the one hand, I got really excited about seeing on the landscape 
examples of regenerative agriculture that really were working, that really could change uh, the trajectory of climate change in agriculture in a meaningful way, mitigate emissions, draw down carbon. And on the other hand, these conversations with these four women actually completely changed my idea of what regenerative agriculture was and what it needed to be and what the origins were of the problems with an extractive agriculture in the US that was leading to climate change in the first place. So in a nutshell, what I really learned with Healing Grounds is that what's being called regenerative agriculture is, is really the ancestral traditions of indigenous communities on this continent, on the African continent, on the Asian continent, and that that's really where regenerative agriculture comes from, that these communities have thousands of years of experience of these techniques. And not only are these sort of you know, ancient techniques that were important thousands of years ago, these very communities have been on the front lines of the development of an extractive agriculture in the US, on the front lines with their bodies, with their labor, as their lands have been stolen, and they have actually refined their regenerative farming systems as a means of survival and resistance over the past couple of hundred years in resisting these colonial and extractive forms of agriculture. So I came out of Healing Grounds with this deep appreciation for the need for the regenerative agriculture movement to really take leadership from indigenous communities and communities of color and see this synergy between these movements for liberation and these movements for regeneration. And that these are actually really one and the same. And that as we're looking to climate solutions in agriculture, that is really, really deeply connected to the work of racial justice in the food system and on this continent. So that's a little bit about this book and its origin story. Um, I haven't said anything really about my positionality, which is definitely something we should talk about and was a huge, huge challenge for me in even thinking about taking on this project. I am a white woman. I am talking about knowledge within indigenous communities and communities of color. So that was a huge challenge to figure out how to do this book in a good way that was really supportive and uplifting of these movements and didn't feel extractive in and of itself, which is an ongoing project and the ongoing work of my career. So I will keep it there and looking forward to conversation with Pete. Thank you. All right, great, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Pete uh, Alagona. I'm a colleague of Liz's in uh, the Environmental Studies Program. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the History Department over on this side of campus, and so it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's a treat for me uh, to be able to ask Liz a few questions today because um, I've long admired Liz's work, and because I find uh, when I read her book and when I engage with uh, what she's doing, that there are really a tremendous number of really, in some ways, unexpected uh, for me, although maybe I should have expected more of them, uh, connections, direct connections with, with what I do. Uh, and generally, I study people's relationships uh, with non-human animals that in most contemporary Western societies we call wildlife. And so um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, if you have not yet had an opportunity to read Liz's book, I'm going to suggest that you do. And uh, one of the reasons I'm going to suggest that you do is, first of all, it's just a wonderful um, book. It's a fantastic introduction to regenerative uh, agriculture. It's beautifully written. Um, it's incredibly timely. It's a wonderful kind of personal journey. But I'm also guessing that you, like me, we'll end up seeing a lot of unexpected connections with your interests and your work too. So that's that's my personal just recommendation to get us started off. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> I promise I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be able to say it. So, um, you know, you, you kind of preempted me a little bit because I was going to ask you a question about the arc of your, your journey in writing this book. And you already told us a bit uh, uh, about that. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just shift gears uh, for a second here for my first question, and I am going to read um, two sentences from your conclusion and then ask you about them because there's a wonderful paragraph um, in the conclusion of your book uh, that straddles pages 175 and 76 that I think distills um, a lot of what you're saying and really resonated with me here, but I'm going to take it a slightly different direction. So, so here we go. Uh, this is toward the very end of the book. So the extraction of carbon from soils was just one integral piece of a much larger process of extraction, a process that included the theft of indigenous lands, the forced enslavement of millions of Africans, 
and the extortion of immigrant labor. To repair the soil, we need to repair it all. All right. So I teach an intro environmental studies class, ES1. I've got about 500 students a year in that class, as some of you know. And um, you know that call to action is uh, both very compelling and might seem, if you're an 18-year-old student in my ES1 class, a little bit overwhelming. And so I'm wondering if you can, can speak to that, speak to these connections a little bit, maybe to someone who might just be kind of coming into this or to those of us who teach those students who are coming into this and how to talk to them about the interconnectedness of these issues in a way that is um, inspiring and empowering, but maybe not too overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I relate to this as a person for whom getting into this work, actually, it feels like it was kind of just yesterday that I was new to it as well and asking myself, how can I be part of a sustainable agriculture movement? We weren't using the term regenerative at that time. Organic, right? How can I be part of a thriving future for rural communities where we're doing good things environmentally and our economies are in, in going on a positive trajectory rather than sort of downhill where, you know, things like oil extraction and mining have been going in Montana. Um, and I think, you know, at first it was exciting to think that there might be sort of individual agricultural techniques that if we just applied them, voila, right? <laughs> things would go better. Uh, but I think the more involved I got in movements for a more sustainable agriculture, the more I realized that these movements weren't new, that there had been many attempts to sort of fix agriculture, unsustainable agriculture in the US, and that there was a kind of frustrating story of decades and decades and decades and not a whole lot of progress, right? Still seeing the same sort of extractive monocultures, loss of soil. And so I think I got hungry for something deeper and more durable. And when I asked myself honestly, like, what are the origins of these problems? Why do we continue with this extractive logic? It led to these really big questions about power and about race and, and about sort of why have the food systems that were operating in a really sustainable way, what, what happened to those systems? And I think, you know, at the same time, there, there were other issues that I cared about, including social justice issues. And so in some ways, there was something really exciting to see that there was a synergy between working on social justice and working on environmental regeneration. And so instead of this like long homework list of all the very many problems in the world that all need to be worked on individually, to realize that they're connected and that in fact, if we work in coalition in really informed ways that we, that we might be able to help each other out. Yeah. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you. And again, for me, it really resonates with the things that I do. You know, people who study um, human relationships with other animals often say um, that when we study other animals, what we often end up seeing is them holding up a mirror to us and we see ourselves. Um, it's so important to recognize um, what we bring to that, right? Um, it's also important to be able to see the, the creature for itself, right? And so I think that seeing these um, interconnected systems and seeing what we bring to them is one of the most important things that we can do, not only in our research and environmental studies, but in our teaching too. So thank you for that. Um, I want to ask you a question about some, some key terms <laughs> that come up in your, in your book. And there, there's two that really kind of struck me that emerged over and over again, and that sound really different coming off the, off the tongue. So one of these is uh, ecosystem services, and another one is decolonization, <laughs> two really different things. So, um, you know, when I think of the term ecosystem services, I think of a view of nature that is very practical, practical, very measurable, very quantifiable, you know, very much in the present, it has a lot to do with things like economic efficiency. Um, and it's also a fundamentally kind of anthropocentric value system toward nature, right? The term decolonization is about something much bigger in a way, right? Um, it's an attempt to come to terms with a painful and traumatic history. It's about justice and inequality. Um, and as kind of imperfect as it is, it's also trying to be about imagining a different possible future one that includes things like um, reparative justice. And so 
I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, how about how in your thinking you sort of navigate uh, both in the book and in what you're what you're focused on today um, between these very very different views of the world and views of our relationship with nature and with others in community um, when you're trying to understand the problems of regenerative agriculture? Mm, yeah, that's a really great question uh, because I think there is a lot of um, kind of translational work in this very big tent movement around regenerative agriculture. People come to it with different terms that they maybe relate more to. And so figuring out how we can have conversations together is maybe one of the key <laughs> foundational points to, to sort of having any success with the work. Um, I mean, for me, I think there have been, I've experienced layers of trying to understand this problem and understand what I can do to be part of a solution. And I think one really important um, first step for me as somebody who was, you know, raised in the middle of industrial U.S. agriculture, seeing that all around me, with the term ecosystem services or that concept was just to see that there is something that farmers can provide to society besides just the crop that they sell. So just to have that framework that what we are asking of farmers as society, and this would be embedded in our policies, is not just to grow X amount of wheat or X amount of corn, but we care about farmers producing things like water quality or building organic matter or how what they do affects air quality, that these are things that farmers can contribute to society. And so what I appreciate about this ecosystem services term that was developed by biologists and economists working together is just the idea of making visible that there are contributions that can be made that affect um, not just people that affect the non-human environment, um, as a means of thinking about policies or economic vehicles that could actually incentivize people to do those things. That term has really been critiqued as sort of boxing us into only sort of market value, having to put a price on things, which is very different than a lot of indigenous worldviews around relationship with the natural world. But if you're starting from the standpoint that I was starting from, um, you know, growing up as a white woman in Montana in the 80s, it was a step forward for me to actually start thinking about myself in relation to the natural world. And it helped me get to a place where I could understand why we need something like decolonization, just to even be able to see that there's something happening other than producing a commodity. And so in a way, I think it kind of prepared me for deeper conversations. But I think first, and I know we, we've got maybe a little bit more coming up about this later, but I think there was a lot I needed to understand about the history of the continent that I was growing up on to understand why decolonization would be relevant. Because I didn't really understand that I was living in a place that was experiencing an ongoing legacy of colonialism and colonial logics. That, that was a process to understand that that was going on and that that's why agriculture looked the way that it did. So I think ecosystem services helped me as a kind of bridge to even see that work on land can involve something other than just producing a commodity. It's also a process to make sure that people don't understand that, right? as well. Um, that's a fantastic answer, and I, I, I really appreciate it because it speaks to the question that I was going to ask about your personal journey um, with regard to the book as well. So thank you so much um, for that. Um, I want to now ask about a term that uh, I don't think actually comes up in your book, but it's sort of woven throughout in a way. Um, and it's one that I wrestle with uh, quite a bit uh, in my own work. Um, so it, it's the term traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. Um, so based on your work, how do you think that we can better elevate systems of traditional ecological knowledge, which is, I think, um, what you're talking about in a lot of different cases in different ways throughout the book, uh, within regenerative, regenerative agriculture, in the context of a frankly, political economic system that is in many ways aligned directly uh, against that. And I'm particularly interested in this because it seems to me that one of the biggest challenges with thinking about traditional ecological knowledge is not simply treating it as a grab bag of things, of insights and practices that you know we can take and then deploy, we, whoever the we is, can take and then deploy in some 
just form of, a, you know, new form of scientific reductionism or just extraction. You mentioned the term extraction. So in the world that we live in today, how can we better think about how to actually incorporate traditional ecological knowledge and maybe even broader traditional socio-ecological systems um, into the worlds that we actually currently inhabit today, most of us? Yeah, I think that's a really important point about traditional socio-ecological systems, because I, I think what the kind of regenerative agriculture community is really struggling with is an impulse towards cherry picking or um, kind of pedestalizing individual practices that can be incorporated into an existing social and economic framework. So to say, you know, like, oh, this indigenous crop is a superfood, right? Let's grow it on a plantation. <laughs> Those kinds of things, right? Um, or uh, agroforestry, right? This one thing, and we can identify this as something that traditional ecological knowledge holders have done. It will do this one thing, but we'll kind of insert it into an, an existing social and economic system because that doesn't require as much change or as much transformation of our society. We can really admire the sort of practice. We can almost um, almost sort of commodify these like superfoods or these practices and insert them. Um, a very different approach would be to say, oh, actually these communities need land justice. We need to rematriate land to indigenous communities. Um, black farmers who are in diaspora also need land justice so they have access to land for these whole socio-ecological systems that go beyond an individual crop or an individual practice. Because what I, what I found in looking at what actually makes these systems regenerative and make a really big difference at a biogeochemical level, it wasn't just the individual practices, it was the whole value system underlying the way people structured a food system. So I think those are two very different calls to action and they're different political lifts too, right? One is to say, um, you know, buy superfoods or let's have a little bit more money in the farm bill for agroforestry. A harder lift is to say, actually, you know, these communities who have these socio-ecological systems need land and capital and power in order to revitalize these systems. And it is really only these societies being able to function and be whole that is really going to lead to the, the benefits that everybody gets excited about with respect to traditional ecological knowledge. Yeah, so it is, it's, about, it's about power and democracy and sharing the planet as opposed to um, especially looking at things through a historical lens and um, saying, you know, these, these things only exist in the past and can we sort of bring back the animal or the plant as opposed to looking at the deep connections between people and plants and animals. Absolutely. You know, this is a thing that I, I worry about and I see in um, discussions about fire in California. You know, oh, so many indigenous people used fire on the landscape. We should do that too. Well, wait a minute. What was the purpose of fire? Fire was woven into a much richer, much more complex socio-ecological system. You burned to clear out the undergrowth uh, and forests and prevent larger fires, but you also did it to cultivate deer grass, which is then used to create ornate basketry, which can be used as a tool, but is also exquisite art that is then traded between bands when people move from band to band, when, for example, um, daughters move to marry in different bands. It creates forage for deer that are then game in the forest. And oh, by the way, now when you're walking through a forest that isn't choked with brush, you can look a couple hundred yards up there and see a grizzly bear, which is literally your grumpy uncle. It's literally an ancestor and maybe walk around it because you don't want to always have to deal with your grumpy uncle, even though it's really important in the forest. And so these, you know, these are examples of the ways in which um, it's really important, as you said, not to cherry pick, but to really engage and think about the complexity of these systems. All right, you know, we're here in the IHC, and um, as some of you may know, the history department is downstairs. And uh, history is important. History is important in this building. It's also important in your book. Um, you engage with, with history in uh, a bunch of different ways in your book. Um, but I'm curious to know what you see um, as the value in particular of that engagement with history, of that historical scholarship um, that you do, considering that I think you and I both to a certain extent um, lament the fact that we inhabit uh, fields in which history is often um, 
uh, either discounted, forgotten, framed as background in academic articles, um, even though it could be foreground, uh, or, or even treated um, with a kind of fraught adversarial relationship. Um, and what I'm talking about is, is uh, you know, the study of food systems and also conservation. So what do you see as the value of engaging with his history and historical scholarship in the way that you did in your work? So I'm going to build on something that you said in our prep conversation yesterday. So <laughs> I'm taking a lot of this straight from Pete. Because um, I think, you know, you pointed out that there's really two big things that are really valuable about engaging with history when we're thinking about how to solve contemporary environmental problems. And I'll just say that both Pete and I are really active in advocacy around current policy. So we are really invested in these contemporary challenges, but I think we both found it worthwhile to spend a lot of time digging into the history of these challenges in order to be more effective advocates for the things that we care about. So why is that worthwhile to spend that time digging into that history? Um, I think I think one is so that we better understand how we got to where we are. And the, the problem I really care about around an, an unsustainable US food system I was trained to understand as a 20th century problem. And I spent a solid decade thinking that it was a 20th century problem, that the reason we have um, eroded soils and why we've lost so much carbon in our soils, why we have such terrible water quality in rural areas is because of the rapid industrialization of US agricultural following World War II when there was all this you know, sort of rapid expansion of chemical factories for wartime that then was converted to peacetime. That's a really big part of the story that circulates in the organic movement in the US. And it is an important part of understanding why we have the agriculture we have. But there's not enough historical depth there to really understand where the problem came from. And I think it took understanding, oh, this is really rooted in processes that started centuries earlier. That industrialization made sense in the context of a power structure that was sort of already determined through these colonial processes. That was why we ended up with these industrial technologies. They were grafted on top of a, a logic and a power structure in an economy that, that already pre-existed the development of those technologies by centuries. Understanding that is so important to understanding what you might do to try to resolve the problems. Because if you just attack it at the technological level alone, you totally miss all of the social factors that are actually shaping which kinds of technologies and why and for whom and for what purpose. So looking at history is really important to understand how we got to where we are. But it's also really important, and you brought this up yesterday, to understand that there are alternative futures that we could be inhabiting. So if we're just looking at a challenge in a very circumscribed geographic context and a circumscribed temporal context, it can be hard to imagine that things could be otherwise. And I've talked to so many farmers who have a really hard time imagining things could be otherwise because they're locked in, right? They're in a great deal of debt. They've bought really expensive machinery. The farm bill only subsidizes them, you know, only provides solid crop insurance for certain. It can be hard to get outside of that sense of like, what could I possibly be doing this year other than planting corn and soybeans? But I think looking more deeply in history and also looking more deeply around the world, you can see oh, like radically alternative things have been true in times and places not so distant from our own. And it helps then as we look forward to imagine something more transformative, more ambitious than simply a kind of incremental approach to could we tweak the subsidies here or there? Great, great. I'm really glad we had that conversation <laughs> yesterday. I'm looking forward to the next one already. So, um, here, here's a question about um, action, about how to get things done. So in your book, you really, um, I think, toggle back and forth in a way between discussions about um, very big picture topics, like, like the historical uh, part, but also big picture political economic systems, legal frameworks, and institutions, that sort of stuff. And then you're also on the ground, and you're in communities, in places, talking to individual people, developing these kind of intimate uh, conversations and relationships with them. And so I'm curious um, about your view about change. You know, how should we think about change in a field like regenerative agriculture um, in terms of top-down forces, 
versus the more grassroots, bottom-up ways to try to affect change. Yeah, I think it's definitely an interplay between the two, and I think it, it sort of matters how those two things relate to each other. So I've been really inspired when I can go and see an example in a place. I can be in a place. I can be on someone's farm. I can be with Latrice Tatsy in this pasture where buffalo are being restored, and I can feel it, and I can see it. That stokes my sense of possibility to then get involved in organizing for policy change. And I think those stories are really helpful to advocates who, who work to change policies, work to change the structures that make some things more possible, some things less possible. Um, so I think it's about, you know, how do we create those kinds of, um, you know, safe spaces, pilot projects, places for us to build an imagination of what could be, and then how do we connect up as people engaged in all of those efforts locally to then have, have a really powerful voice in Sacramento, in Washington, D.C., at the United Nations, in all these places where there are opportunities to change incentives, change structures. And so then I think what it means for people who are, who are sitting in those halls of power, right, who are the Senate staffers or the people working in agencies, if you're in that position, how do you make sure that you're really connecting to those exciting movements at the grassroots level and, and sort of letting those collective voices drive what you're doing structurally. Yeah, because it has to, we have to build power, I think is, is what I've learned at the end of the 15 years, right? That it's not just a technological challenge, it's not just an absence of science, that there's a power struggle for what the US food system is gonna look like. And so all of us involved in these local efforts have to figure out how to get together and build power. In our conversation yesterday, I mentioned to you, and I'll just very quickly repeat it here, that I spent the first about 15 years or so of my career studying environmental policy from a historical perspective. And then over the last couple of years, I've been able to work with someone who's one of the most effective uh, wildlife advocates um, in the country, who's trained as a, a lawyer. And within a few weeks of working with this person, I, I kind of said, oh, so that's how it works. And it was this enlightening, humbling, forehead slapping sort of moment of, um, first of all, realizing that you can learn a lot in academia through doing advocacy work. Like that is, that kind of practice is an actual like uh, method that really can be, a lot can be gained from that. And also um, kind of getting uh, a different window into these things. And one of the my takeaways there uh, from that, uh, those discussions and that collaboration um, is that people in positions of power can exercise it, but in general, they prefer to lead from behind, right? And so maybe this speaks to that a little bit. Yeah, and I think there's also a necessary collaboration between people who work on what can be achieved in the conditions we currently have, right? So I have friends who are working on the U.S. Farm Bill, which is currently in cycle. So every five years or so, there's this big opportunity to influence federal agricultural policy. And my friends who are working on this cycle are very aware of, like, who's in Congress now, who's, you know, both houses, right, who may or may not be the president, and like, what are the achievable things in this cycle? And it's important that people are doing that work, and it's also important, and I think that's what this project has been a lot about, is people who are working for things that are gonna take longer than one farm bill cycle. So there's the people working to change things within the current sense of what's possible, and there's the people wor working to change what's possible, working to change the discourse about what's seen as possible. And I have seen over the course of my career, sometimes those folks be at odds with each other, upset with each other, right? And you can imagine why that would be if you're working for deep change. You might feel like, oh, you know, these folks aren't thinking, you know, deeply enough. Vice versa, the folks working to change the farm bill now might feel like, wait, you're asking for something we can't do this cycle. Like, why are you, I think it's really important that actually those two kinds of political work are, are in a relationship to each other, understanding that they're synergistic. And some of us, you know, gravitate towards one, some of us gravitate towards the other. We can help each other out in, in particular moments, but I think they both need to happen simultaneously. Amen. Susan, do we have time for one more question? before we open it up? Okay, this one's a little bit less um, formed, but um, I, I want to throw it out there uh, anyway. So in your book, 
you don't um, spend a lot of time dwelling on the idea of property. Uh, a lot of economists spend a lot of time thinking about property. Um, the United States can be conceived in part as an elaborate vessel to um, protect white male property, at least in its origins, right? Um, and it seems like in your story, whether we're talking about the dispossession of land, whether we're talking about uh, things that are part of a food system that move, that cross borders, whether they're bison or water or uh, nitrogen, whatever it is, um, property is an essential aspect of understanding this and of uh, kind of reconciling our relationships uh, with the land. In many ways, our property structures um, challenge us in ways and make it harder to do things, whereas other kinds of structures can facilitate um, better sort of uh, more sustainable land relations, as many economists have um, uh, have studied. So I'm wondering what your, your view is on this and how um, issues of property emerged uh, in your work and are affecting the work of the people that you are working with on the ground? Yeah, I think for me, one of the clearest just visual examples of this was thinking about the history of the Northern Great Plains and thinking about sort of what made these ecosystems and these buffalo food systems really work and really ecologically productive. And that had to do with, because this was this arid landscape, it had to do with the movement of both animals and people in response to each other, right? Animals in response to vegetation, people in response to vegetation and animals, people setting fires, this like like intricate dance um, of movement, and then how that was disrupted, of, of course, by genocide, of course, by actual you know, murder of these bison and of these people, and also by this fencing off in this landscape that made that movement that was necessary to life impossible. Um, and the fencing you know, was sort of ostensibly for, for managing cattle. There's this whole interesting history of like early range management that a, a mutual friend of ours engages with very deeply. Um, but in, in fact, um, a lot of those arguments about how the fences were necessary to manage the cattle don't really hold water. And you realize the real reason for building the fences was to effectively carve up these individual tracts of private property that could be sort of financialized in a particular way. And so I think that for me is one of the clearest examples of where there's this collision between a way of life, an ecosystem, a food system, that really makes sense for a place, and then a particular vision of imposing a particular property structure that's just 180 degrees from that other life way. And those two things collide, and they, they can't really coexist with each other. Um, and so in, in the later part of this book, I got to talk with, with folks who are um, starting these kind of next generation land trusts that not only aim to acquire land and then make it available to indigenous communities and communities of color for these regenerative farming projects, but also to sort of change the land tenure relationship to one that's more congruent with these ancestral ideas of land as relative rather than land as property. Um, and those conversations were really interesting as people kind of got into the weeds of um, you know, legal agreements and cooperative structures and things that could help um, bridge from the kind of um, property system that we have now in the United States to a sort of land as relative perspective and allow that kind of that level of relationship that existed in that buffalo food system where people really could respond to the needs of land um, and that people could be in relationship with each other, plants, animals, in a way that has a lot more cooperation and flexibility built into it than this sort of fee simple title. Yeah, so I think it's really important to think about how property relates to how any of these things are possible. It's really inspiring to hear about all the creative thinking that's going on in this area. And um, I think it's time to open it up to um, the broader room. But I just want to thank you so much for um, the opportunity to, to have this conversation. So if anybody has uh, any, any questions uh, or comments um, for Liz, now would be the, uh, the time to ask them. Hi. Um, my question was, how can people here or people who are like stuck consuming mm. the current food system, how can they support regenerative agricultural movements? I love that question. I think about that a lot. Um, and I think there are so many entry points. Um, I think that um, 
one thing that, that I've heard some of the folks that I had the privilege to interview say a lot is how important developing some kind of connection to land has been in their own journey. I love the chapter of Braiding Sweet Grass where Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about growing a garden. Um, and so I think in the context of UCSB, I think, um, you know, edible campus program and, um, you know, greenhouse garden project, all of these ways of, of having some connection to land um, personally, um, I think is actually really meaningful, even if it sometimes seems like a small step or even obviously if you're not sort of growing all your own food, but just that connection to land and, um, yeah, having that opportunity to develop a relationship with a piece of land as you're growing some food or planting some seeds. Or, you know, honestly, um, working in North Campus open space, too. I think there is a lot of connection between the work that we both do and the more that we um, sort of deconstruct these ideas of agriculture and wildlands, the more I think that we find that there's a lot of gray area in between. So I've spoken with students who've done the um, restoration skills class who've had a similar kind of experience of feeling like it really deepened a connection to land. Um, I think that um, also that sort of um, raising your voice piece is really important. Um, and I think there are some really tangible ways to raise your voice um, with respect to some of the policies we've been talking about, and especially in this farm bill cycle. So there are groups that sort of organize people to say like, this is what we want for federal policy. Um, so groups like Heal Food Alliance support this type of federal policy or National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Um, and so, you know, one person sending that letter as somebody who used to read those letters in a congressional office, one person like uh, doesn't really make that much difference. But when you engage in a campaign in the context of somebody organizing a bunch of people, it really can make a big difference. Um, and then I think just also, I, I really believe in this idea of um, sort of what we can collectively imagine. And so I, I do think that stories matter and I do think that histories matter. And so even just, you know, sharing these stories of what's out there and what's possible and the kinds of things we would want to support um, when we have the ability is also really helpful um, because those conversations, I think, really shape the actions that we all take. So those are a few things. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I work in the Maya area and I work with people who are traditional land use practitioners and I see some of the, uh, this is sort of a two-part question I would say, or issue. I see that there are great principles, the same principles that you probably found in the Buffalo area that they want to uh, maintain biodiversity because they're a local, they want to have more than just one fruit or one tree for construction. In fact, you need different trees for different parts of a house, for example. Uh, they want to lower temperature and they want to conserve water and they want to retain uh, 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 soil and they want to build soil fertility or an organic matter and that's part of the whole practice. So, uh, and then when I go and talk, I've talked with uh, Carver Hall staff and Carver Hall too, but in an effort, uh, something about the farm bill, which I really, I find imponderable. I don't know how you, <laughs> can go from that farm bill cycle to the philosophical principles that are really, uh, the difference I see more is, is uh, uh, maximizing profit versus minimizing risk. And if we are going to go forward, and you only mentioned future in one word, I mean really we have to think of seven generations ahead, uh, or at least several generations ahead that we, they, they, we want good water, good soil, not erode it all and whatever, we need to be thinking in terms of minimizing risk. And I feel that's one of the big problems. And I meet them, and of course, I'm an academician, and then I'm working with real people, but I'm not thinking. They want to know real, they're, they're all happy to think about what I bring up, but they want tangible things here, you know. I don't know, also, is everyone going to go to the seed swap this um, Sunday uh, in uh, uh, 11 through 4 at uh, court, uh, the work, what is it, the Santa Barbara Art, art collective or whatever it is there at uh, uh, Garden and, uh, and Ortega, I really recommend it because that will be where people like you can so find out what are people doing, you know, what are they doing with seeds, how are they saving seeds, how are they moving forward, and these are all really the bottom down. I don't know if Carbrawl or any of his staff would come there, but they should because that is where, that's where some of that alignment would be. But they think, you know, I just couldn't, I, uh, I was really, I'm still, 
struggling. They want a line item. You know, okay, yeah. okay, I think, well, we better make sure, like the policy and the land tenure thing, that we don't change. You know, we have some urban farms because what happens if we have a flood down on in Montecito and a fire up in uh, Gaviota? We won't have any food here if we don't start figuring out or victory gardens, any kind of thing. But I don't know how to build a line item. Maybe you can talk to what are the line items we could propose to Carver Hall? Not that we'll get anything through at this <laughs> for another reason of the cycle, but but really, what are things that they can say? Santa Barbara can benefit from and every county or state can benefit from that we would actually be able to leverage from to get more food sovereignty to the site. Yeah, it's a good point. The process around the farm bill can get really arcane and I think that's why some of these groups are so important like Heal Food Alliance or National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition or the Union of Concerned Scientists Food and Environment Program because I, I think they do a really important job of bridging. They're all sort of, they all work on a coalitional level. And so they are in touch with the kinds of groups that organize the seed swap or that are engaged in urban farming in a particular place. And they're also engaged in the kind of inside baseball in DC. And they sort of help translate the vision of all of these really important grassroots projects that have transformative goals into like what's a marker bill that we can propose to get included in the farm bill. Because the kind of, um, the arcane piece is that the farm bill isn't just one bill, it's an omnibus piece of legislation. So it's a package of bills that get passed. And so one of the key fo focuses of advocacy is to write a few of these bills that folks try to get included in the package to get passed. And so, yeah, groups like Heal Food Alliance or Union of Concerned Scientists Food and Environment Program sort of have that list of Mm. Yes. You could spend a long time reading through the whole bill. Yeah. And I think the, the challenge is, is sort of to get something passed, you need... Um, representatives and senators from all over the country to vote for it. So when people devise these marker bills, they're trying to think of a program that would provide resources that would support something happening in Santa Barbara, something happening in Texas, something happening in New Hampshire. So, uh, um, you know, uh, either getting more resources for an existing program or starting a new program that all of those local efforts could draw on. And then... Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is a gap to be bridged for sure from the kind of federal policy level to the practice level, which is why it's so good to have, you know, friends working at multiple levels of this process from doing the local project to advocating for the bill and everywhere in between. I think we're bumping up against um, five, five o'clock-ish. Um, so maybe uh, if, if we have one more question, if somebody wants to ask a question, then we can, we can end on that. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I would be curious to hear more about what you were speaking about, that you know, there are some groups that are really concerned about what is possible right now in the current framework versus uh, people, groups, companies, organizations who are thinking about uh, how can we change what is possible and the fact that they're bumping up against each other. I find that to be interesting and I can relate to that myself as I'm working in sustainability and I, I see it myself, like within myself. Mm -hmm. In the work I do right now, I feel like it's really about what can we change right now 
And I often think about like, well, we need to change what's possible, actually. Um, and I would just love to hear if you can speak more about what that collaboration needs to look like or can look like to bring the two together. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I have wrestled with that myself. And I will say that, you know, over the course of my life, I have found myself on different parts of that spectrum. When I was working on the Hill as an aide to a senator, my head was 100% in like, what is possible in the next you know, election cycle, basically. What can we get done with the constituents that we have and the political views that they currently hold? Um, whereas, um, you know, certainly in working on this book, I've really been thinking as ambitiously as I can, you know, fit into my brain about, you know, where really do we need to go in agriculture? Where, where do we need to get to? Um, how can we change what we think is politically possible or what those constituents think. Um, and I do think that both of those kinds of work are important. And I think there's always going to be a, a tension between organized groups of people working in those two ways. I don't think that it's ever going to be a completely harmonious conversation, right? If you're really pushing for land justice, you are going to be frustrated with people whose only vision is of, you know, increasing a certain line item in the farm bill. And if you um, are really pushing for that increase in that line item in the farm bill and you see the difference that it could tangibly make to people within the next five or 10 years to do that, you might be frustrated with people who are critiquing that as not enough. And I think those, those tensions are also healthy. But I think for me, just in terms of um, building out my own web of relationships, I've really tried to embrace having colleagues and friends who are everywhere along that spectrum and having conversations with folks and having, if, if not, you know, complete agreement with each other, having um, respect for what each other are doing and so that we can call on each other in important moments. If, if there's that time when everybody needs to call Salud Carbajal and have him vote on something and you can see something tangible as possible, maybe for those 30 seconds, the folks working on the really ambitious long-term things, go ahead and call Salud Carbajal, you know, and see that that's a step along the way. And by the same token, the folks who are really in the now, when their friends who are working on these long-term transformative vision organize a big march or a big action or there's some opportunity to really shift where public opinion is, the folks working on the kind of more near-term things show up for that. So I think it's a kind of appreciating that we're working in different registers, um, trying to support each other and trying to have respect for the fact that, you know, we have different theories of change and we're maybe working on different timelines. I'll also just say that the idea ideal situation is you take the things that seem impossible, you make them possible, and you make them the regular daily work. And in the, in the area that, that I work in having to do with um, re rewilding, in part, um, there are things being implemented now that 20 years ago were seen as, as virtually impossible. And one of the things that comes to mind is that right now in California, we're in the process of the largest dam removal project ever, anywhere. Right, and actually, you can go. There were some uh, portion of the dam, the third dam in the, on the Klamath was dynamited yesterday. You can go online and see that explosion if you want. Um, but that was something that was uh, the product of a quarter century of work, which, when it began, seemed utterly impossible and was just part of a giant, terribly unsustainable. Uh, industrial agricultural system dating back a century that had imposed tremendous costs uh, for the river, for the ecosystem, for the fish, and for the people who live there, including uh, the tribes who live in the area. Um, and so now that's actually happening, and now it's just, now it's dynamite, you know? It's, it's just concrete, it's happening. And so I think that that ultimately is the goal, but these projects can take a long time. Yeah, and sometimes working on near-term projects can actually help build power for the longer-term projects, too. So that's another wonderful kind of ideal synergy is you get your friends together to organize to, uh, you know, save a piece of land that's going to be developed or demolished that's been a community garden for a long time, and you start having conversations about your common values, and you start talking about these are the policies we want to support in Sacramento. And so I think there are also ways that the near-term work can build into the longer-term work.